Um, thank you everyone for joining us here in the Clifford Chance Sao Paulo office and for those of us uh, joining virtually. My name is Michelle McGreal. I am a partner in the Clifford Chance New York um, office in the restructuring group and I practice in in court and out of court restructurings representing uh, debtors, creditors, lenders, uh, various types of investors. I'm really excited. This is my first time here in Brazil, and um, I'm excited to meet all of you. Hopefully, uh, for those in the room, uh, you can join us for drinks after the presentation. And I will be here all week, so if we don't get a chance to chat, uh, if you have time in your schedule, I'd love to, to meet for coffee. Um, so let's get started. We are very lucky to be joined um, by a man that I know needs no introduction to, to this group, uh, Thomas Felsberg of Felsberg Out and um, I can assure you, actually, although I just met uh, Thomas today in person, um, his reputation precedes him because I've known him <laughs> for all of my time in practice in the U.S. Um, as, as really the leading authority on, on uh, Latin American restructuring and insolvency. So thank you, Thomas, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, and the topic today is um, considerations for parties involved in Brazilian restructurings and U.S. restructurings and the interconnection uh, between the two. And of course, we have two very recent examples in Americanos and OI. Uh, and so I'd like to kick off just asking Thomas, I know a, a lot of folks in the room and, and online will have the background about all that's been going on, but um, Thomas, I know you're very close to it. Uh, so if you could let us know of any, any recent developments um, locally, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you also, Clifford Chance, for, for this opportunity. Uh, okay, Americanas. Americanas was a shock here in Brazil. It was unexpected. It was considered by asset managers as being a very secure investment. And all of a sudden, you know, there are these accounting inconsistencies of 20 billion reais. And what happened was that the whole development of situation of Americanos was chaotic. Uh, there was a relevant fact which mentioned accounting inconsistencies of 20 billion reais. Uh, all, all of a sudden, there was a meeting uh, among the largest banks, and one of the banks simply accelerated the debt and took uh, an amount uh, which was deposited in its accounts because of this debt, debt acceleration. And, and so many creditors were, were annoyed by this, uh, by this situation, which, which only got worse when, uh, when the reference shareholders, the main shareholders of Americana, published a notice in the newspaper saying that people knew about these inconsistencies, which, of course, created uh, uh, a huge litigation where where people were very upset by by these uh, these developments um, it's amazing that such a large case was not done in a in a more sensible way you know in terms of preparing the company of uh, giving a horizon of what would be expected but uh, it seems now that that the situation has cleared a little bit because the reference shareholders have already committed to capitalize the company with 10 billion reais, $2 billion. And negotiations have started already among the, the creditors and the, and the debtors to try to, to see if there is a solution for the company. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in the company published that what they were thinking of proposing to the to the creditors was a capital infusion, uh, a debt to equity swap, and the purchase of certain debts uh, with a discount. So they, they these three instruments. And uh, although there are confidentiality agreements, and I'm not allowed to disclose much of what has been discussed, the the Pillars of a plan are basically these three, you know, the, these are the three pillars which, which have to be uh, considered. Uh, 
a new CEO now seemingly will start working and he is a restructuring guy, which is positive. You know, the company indeed, indeed needs a restructuring. One of the main questions we had all around, you know, to Rothschild was, so how is the restruct restructuring going? And now they're also looking at the strategic plan for the company also by, by well-known uh, companies and so on. So, so it seems that uh, negotiations are underway. There is a concern about how the company will look if it emerges of, uh, from bankruptcy and, and what will happen. We have a much uh, better situation now than a few days ago when everybody, when it was a complete chaos and everybody was very upset and some very violent litigation went on on different courts. We have, we, we follow up now about 30 cases, you know, in, in this, uh, in addition to the, res the basic restructuring case. So it's a, it's a complex litigation involving administrative issues with the Brazilian SEC, which is called the CVM, and, uh, and uh, even some criminal uh, proceedings and, of course, civil and, and and other proceedings which which are taking and commercial proceedings which are taking place. But uh, you know, if you look at the macro picture, it seems that now we have a, a possibility. You know, in these cases, you're never certain, but there is a possibility of a decent development coming along. We we represent the uh, venture holders in this case. There are six large uh, issuances of debentures. We represent five of them, and we're aligned with the six. And now several bondholders are calling us because they're interested in aligning with us. Uh, if you consider the debentures are about five billion to six billion reais of credits, the bondholders have around six billion, one billion dollar, and together they they have some strength in the overall picture. Uh, recently, we signed together with other creditors a request for a watchdog in the company, and and this request was already signed by forty percent of all the creditors. And if you consider that you need fifty plus one creditors, and there will be five days in which other creditors may join this request to to put a watchdog in the company. So uh, on the whole, in a terrible situation, there is there is a horizon which which uh, could could mean a, a better solution for the company. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of progress in in a fairly short period of time. Um, so let's talk about the Chapter Fifteen angle, which is actually critical to the ultimate success of of a plan that may be approved in in Brazil. Um, so so Chapter Fifteen. Amongst all the headlines, you may have seen that Americanus also filed a Chapter 15 proceeding. So did OI, and this is very common. Most large corporate uh, bankruptcy proceedings that are outside the U.S. Um, may need to file a Chapter 15 proceeding, um, and a Chapter 15 proceeding is essentially asking the U.S. court to recognize what is going on in the court outside the US. And the reason that um, it is needed so often is really the proliferation of New York law governed um, debt instruments. So in Americanus and OI, they both had New York law governed bonds. And if they had not received recognition in the United States, the bondholders could have sued them in New York um, they could have went after their assets that may be located in the U.S. So it is a process that happens um, sometimes simultaneously or pretty quickly after opening a proceeding in Brazil, for example, um, there will need to be a proceeding opened up in, in the U.S. And, you know, it's different than Chapter 11. It is an ancillary proceeding. It's understanding that your main insolvency proceeding is happening outside the U.S., but it is trying to give effect to what is going on and protect the, the company and its assets. Um, uh, in the US and uh, there's a, a very low threshold for the ability to file this type of proceeding. A lot of times uh, we get questions about is there a significant connection with the US? Do I have to do business in the US? And actually uh, the only requirement is that there is property in the US and the property can be as little as 
a retainer with a U.S. law firm, a uh, U.S. bank account. It can even be um, your New York law governed indenture. So it is a relatively low threshold to utilize the U.S. bankruptcy court for this purpose. And it's also a relatively easy process. Um, the foreign representative who can be uh, someone on the board or an officer or a court appointed individual just comes into the US and files a petition for recognition and asks the US court to recognize the proceeding and um, impose what we call the automatic stay, the moratorium that will stay all actions against the company in the territorial jurisdiction of the United States and all actions uh, against its assets that may be located um, in the US. So. Uh, Americanus and Oi both applied for this. They, you know, they had U.S. bank accounts. They had uh, retainers with U.S. law firms. So uh, their their processes went um, pretty smoothly. Their their in Americanus, the proceeding has been recognized already. In Oi, I believe the hearing is at the end of March um, because there is a 30 day notice period before the U.S. court will recognize. Um, the the insolvency proceeding and impose the stay and and because of this notice period actually OI and American has both sought emergency relief for that 30 day period so um, so really there was no ability for uh, a, a creditor to come into the U S and sort of upend um, what is going on in, in Brazil and the ultimate goal is really for the U.S. court to then recognize whatever plan may be approved in Brazil. So if there's a debt for equity swap, um, you would want the U.S. court to also recognize that and and bind anyone in the U.S. to to that um, to that plan so that you don't again have, you know, a year from now, uh, someone coming out of the woodwork and saying, I'm not bound by that in the U.S. and I can try to sue you in the U.S. Um, so it's it's really um, more of an ancillary proceeding to to give effect to what's going on in Brazil. The one interesting um, point that came up, and I think it was really for the first time in Americanus, was this pre-insolvency um, uh, period, which we don't have this concept in the U.S. in Chapter 11, uh, but we um, immediately got a lot of questions about it because as we understood it, it is really a 30-day period for a company to decide whether it may want to file for bankruptcy, negotiate with its creditors to see if maybe it can avoid bankruptcy. But the um, this in this time period, there is a stay on all creditor action. So you're sort of getting the benefit of the bankruptcy uh, stay, but you haven't filed for bankruptcy yet. Um, which is helpful, but uh, normally in bankruptcy, there are exceptions to the automatic stay. Most notably, there are exceptions for counterparties to financially protected contracts. So uh, terminating derivatives and netting and setting off, we all of a sudden realize that this pre-insolvency um, stay doesn't include those exceptions. So in fact, the company is getting something more than what they would even get in a bankruptcy. So we actually, um, really had to think about this. I guess maybe one of the features of the pre-insolvency stay is that once you tell everyone you're thinking about filing for bankruptcy, you sometimes quickly have to file for bankruptcy. So it didn't leave us all that much time to have to think about this issue. But um, I'm wondering, Thomas, what you think about this. Is this something that needs a fix? Is that how it was intended to work? Well, you know, it's it's relatively new. You know, this came about, this, uh, this idea of having pre-insolvency mediation on the one hand or uh, pre-mediation uh, relief you know an injunctive relief uh, prior to the restructure now is is considering but not all the details have been considered but there is an interesting case here for you you know yeah. we we had a case of pro safe safe a singaporean company which actually belonged to Norwegian, Norwegian interests, you know. But the Singaporean company, they had a Brazilian company, a small Brazilian company, but they filed a pre-insolvency proceeding in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And they got even a five-month relief and a protection during five months. And this was recognized under the new Ansertal model law, which was approved in Brazil. So this let's say this pre-insolvency proceeding in Singapore was recognized by the Brazilian court beautifully. And then when it was a scheme of arrangement in Singapore, when that was approved by the Singaporean court, the Brazilian court approved the, the, this uh, restructuring and it became binding in Brazil. 
and it had all the effects which the Singaporean law provided for it. So it's an interesting example. But what is more striking is that in the midst of this restructuring was a Brazilian company, which was actually restructured in Singapore. And that's not the first time that this uh, in the LATAM case, we had TAM. And TAM is a Brazilian company flying only in Brazil and so on. And now all of a sudden, TAM was restructuring in a Chapter 11 in the U.S. And nobody complained, you know. I, I was asked, you know, I said, well, do you want to make a fuss about it? No, let's, let's do the Chapter 11 in the U.S. for airlines. It's much more, how should I say, it's more, it's, uh, it's a better solution for airlines in the U.S. Well, why is it that, Michelle? Well, that's <laughs> um, that's an interesting question, and I I would I would um, guess one of the reasons is that uh, under Chapter Eleven we have a tool called assumption and rejection of contracts and leases that I understand is not available here, and essentially that allows a debtor to decide which contracts and leases it wants to keep and which contracts and leases it wants to get rid of, and so. If there's a, 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 a lease that is long term and they don't want it anymore, the rent is too high, or an aircraft lease for a, a, a plane that um, they don't need anymore in their fleet, they can just reject it. And the rejection has the effect of a pre filing breach, which entitles the counterparty to a damages claim that is a general unsecured claim, which is really the lowest priority of claim in, in Chapter 11. Um, so you can see this, this can be really powerful, not just to potentially downsize your fleet or reduce your footprint in retail, but it's also a really uh, powerful negotiating tool. You can put a contract or lease that you want onto the rejection list and then the counterparty may come to the table and negotiate a better contract at least, or then you take it off the rejection list. And now you have um, a modified contract. And this happens a lot, particularly in distressed um, environments like retail or, or aircraft, because a landlord would rather deal with a uh, unfavorable lease than an empty storefront. Um, and, and so we see this happening in the retail cases. Obviously, we had a number of airline cases, um, particularly out of Latin America, that filed for Chapter 11 utilizing uh, this assumption reje rejection power. And I understand this is not available. Well, you know, here again, a parallel can be drawn with Americanus. Because it was so chaotic, it was, they didn't do what, in many, in many cases, uh, a remedy is applied where you terminate the agreements before you file, mm -hmm. so that these would be pre-filing credits mm -hmm. and then what would be unsecured credits in the restructuring. By not by the, by the whole thing being so chaotic, they had to file without having any time to prepare and to and to find any solution for for these things. This, uh, this uh, complicated the restructuring of, of Americanos. There is a thing which is not commonly used in Brazil, but which could be, and I think should be used. You could alter a contract to a certain extent in the plan. So once, once you have a plan, so the, if you terminate the agreement before a plan is approved, you will have to bear with these with these consequences. If you're able to to how do you amend the contract through the plan, you have a chance of getting away with it. But it's a chance to get away with it. Mm -hmm. It's not clear in the law, and we should have this mechanism of rejection, which we don't have in our law. And I, and I guess maybe another reason is our dip financing um, market in the U.S. I understand that the uh, new amendments that have taken effect have all the features of, of dip financing that we generally use in, in the U.S. And for those who are not familiar, dip financing is the financing available to the company in bankruptcy. Um, and it is it is quite uh, an established market in the U.S. In fact, it's, it's a lucrative business for many investors. Uh, and of course, intuitively, 
you would say, why would you loan money to a, a, a debtor? But um, in our bankruptcy code, there are a number of protections um, that make it uh, not only incentivized, but actually make it profitable for, for a lot of dip lenders. And that those are things like first liens on unencumbered assets, um, priming liens on assets that are already encumbered, super priority claims, which means you get paid first and you're entitled to get paid first in cash before anyone else. Um, and also there's a trend of, of the dip lender really controlling the case. The credit agreement, for example, will often uh, contain milestones that give deadlines by when the debtor has to file certain things in the case or when the debtor has to exit the case. Uh, so there are a lot of controls the dip lender can use. And, and so this makes it fairly popular in chapter 11. Um, and and I think for judges, something that they approve quite often and, and understand complex dips. So, for example, in all of the airline cases, there were, you know, a billion dollars plus of dip financing, which which were needed for for the airlines. So. Are those types of protections available and, and what is the market looking like now for for dip financing here? Well, the, the market is increasing. You know, we have several successful cases of dip loans now. If the court approves in advance a dip loan, you have a super priority. You have one aspect, which in Brazil is very important, you know. In Brazil, you have like four levels of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. you know? And the higher courts, they, they love to correct lower courts' mistakes, you know, and they, they always find some mistake. So... It's not uncommon in a large litigation in Brazil that you win in the first, in the right. lowest instance, and then the Court of Appeal will find differently. The Superior Court of Justice will also have its own appeal. And sometimes even the Supreme Court has to something to do, you know. So, so there's a situation where the, the higher courts, they judge, each judge judges about 18,000 cases a year, quite differently from the U.S., right? So... So, but there is this protection there that once the dip loan has been approved and once the disbursement has been made, it cannot be altered by a subsequent judgment. So it becomes final. Yeah. Fine. And that in Brazil is, is quite, uh, we, we do have a super priority and we also now have the possibility of giving without a creditor's consent as guarantees uh, the value of the security which is above the credit which is secured by it. So, so there are certain features which are new in Brazil which, uh, which help them. But we don't have priming here. Mm -hmm. so, so this, uh, the, and, and the market is increasing. We, we had some very successful dip loans, you know. Renov is a case where we had such a dip loan. And, uh, and in Morin, we had a very interesting exit financing, mm -hmm. which also worked very well. So, so the, the, we are now gradually having more and more cases where a dip loan becomes quite essential for the restructuring of the company. Yeah, and, and lenders getting comfortable that it's going to work and they're going to get paid back. The, do I understand correctly that the dip lenders are not first in priority the are there employees that come first or there are other claims that can come before them well up to 150 minimum wages per employee okay. they come first but other than that uh, they have their second priority so they right. they do have a super priority no matter what yeah uh, of course if there's a security title of which belongs to the creditor then the secured this creditors, the secured creditors uh, prevail yeah well, one trend we're seeing, and and I'm curious, uh, you know, if I come back in a couple of years, or it may take longer than that. But we we in the U.S. have become quite creative with our dip financing structures. So instead of sort of direct lending that you might think of, um, we have things called roll-ups, which are essentially rolling up the uh, if the dip lender is an existing lender, they roll up their existing debt into this new higher priority dip loan. So they do give some new money, but they also um, size the dip based on their uh, pre-existing debt. And so they um, get a higher priority for debt that otherwise would be 
pre-petition debt. Um, we also have uh, conversion dips. So the dip, instead of getting paid out in cash at the end of the case, would get converted into equity at the debtor's option. Actually, all of the airline cases had that component, at least at one point, because when a debtor really doesn't know what the market's going to look like at the end of the case, particularly in COVID, no one knew what the aviation market was going to look like. The only potential way to get out of a restructuring, um, if you can't pay off your your dip, would be to get new money. And so, um, one option is to to pay the dip back in equity, or to uh, convert the dip into exit financing. So, uh, pay the dip back with new new paper that will will be the debt obligations of the the reorganized company. So, are these features possible, or, or are you starting to see any of that here? Yes, yes, it's possible. We we have a concept here which has been accepted by the courts, which we call partnering creditors. So if you're a partnering creditor, and let's say you you extend new facilities or new financings to the company, you may roll up your old debt into this. This, of course, has to be approved. Normally, it's approved in the plan and the court has then to approve it, you know, so it's subject to litigation. It's, uh, it's uh, because, uh, you know, all these, uh, these uh, more sophisticated uh, tools which you have available in, in restructurings, they can also be used, uh, let's say, to, to wipe out all existing assets of the company and favor uh, in a in an unfair way the creditor so so this is subject to judicial review and yeah. and also to to the possibility to litigate or if if there is for instance a dip loan that another creditor may offer the same terms mm -hmm. and and participate either participate or offer better terms and 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 uh, be the lender in, in a diploma. Yeah, yeah. Cor courts will definitely scrutinize more these types of of, of loans, uh, especially if there's going they're going to be um, uh, detrimental to the minority creditors. Um, an another trend we're seeing is uh, the rise of prepackaged bankruptcies, and this is not really a new phenomenon in, in Chapter 11. This is a prepackaged bankruptcy is when uh, most of the work is done before uh, filing, I think extra judicial, um, and, uh, and then you come to the bankruptcy court and essentially get it blessed. And it really only works for a balance sheet restructuring. You're just dealing with one or two subsets of financial creditors, and maybe you have some holdouts. You can't get to the requisite consents out of court, so you use the bankruptcy process, which only requires 66 and two thirds um, consents to to uh, modify or discharge financial obligations. And so um, you can solicit your creditors uh, uh, beforehand and get the consents you need and then come to the bankruptcy court and get a bankruptcy court order that approves the plan. The the trend that is really interesting and 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 quite beneficial is that we've really expedited the process of prepacks. We used to say it would probably take about 30 days, which is a really short timeline for a chapter 11 case, but in the past couple of years, uh, the bankruptcy judges have been open to shortening this time period even to a day or like 12 hours. So we have we call these super fast or super speed. No, no, there's no official name yet for it, um, but it's really the bankruptcy judges getting comfortable and realizing that there's no need to spend really any time in bankruptcy. It may be holdouts that are never going to agree or that you can't even find, so you can't even solicit them. Um, and so uh, this is really beneficial for the company because they can save the time and expense that comes with a, a Chapter 11 filing. But also, it's a good news story that the the company will usually issue a press release that says we got to an agreement with 80% of our creditors to effectuate a, a debt to equity swap, and then you know in little letters below it'll say to be effectuated through a Chapter 11. So they don't really have to announce they filed, and it can be you, you spent one day in bankruptcy. Um, so I know that Brazil has prepackaged bankruptcy procedures. Uh, how are they going? Have people been uh, using them? Uh, they're not used too often, you know. There's a cultural problem where people, the denial period is too long, you know. People, yeah. they, they don't take 
they don't do what they have to do in a timely manner. But uh, we had some success cases in in uh, prepex. Uh, basically, there are, there are two scenarios. We, with one third of the credits of a certain nature, you you don't have to restructure all the credits. You can choose what what are the credits you you have to restructure to restructure the company. Mm -hmm. So. You, you choose a certain class, and if you have one-third of these credits, you can file. And then you have 90 days to get to 50 plus one majority. And then the judge will approve the plan. So that would be our prepack. Yeah. Uh, we had a few cases where prepack was done and uh, was successful in 60 or 90 days. That was the fastest mm -hmm. we, we got here in, the, in this country. And I, I hope that uh, they become more frequent because it's it's usually uh, very very beneficial for the company to get in and out of insolvency, you know, and become a a normal company yeah. quickly. Uh, the we also have a proceeding here which sometimes work, which we call the extra extra judicial proceeding. Mm -hmm. A prepack is an extra judicial, yeah. and a extra extra judicial is once you get the required majority say 50 plus one you go to the other creditors and say listen you're bound by this if we go to court you know in 30 60 days you'll be bound by this agreement why don't you sign it and uh, uh, we avoid altogether you know going to court and the judicial involvement and so on right so you and can use it as a threat work, yeah. you know if yeah. there's common sense and people really say that they have no other option, you know. So, why, why force a comp company to file for insolvency and get all the bad press and all, all the consequences? Yeah, and that's a very uh, reachable threshold. That's that's lower than our sixty-six and two-thirds. So, that can be really helpful. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to touch on sales of assets because that has been another fairly common approach to restructuring in Chapter Eleven. Um, Sometimes it can be out of a distressed M and A situation. There's a purchaser who's interested in assets of a distressed company. Sometimes it's a loan to own situation. The lenders actually want to own the company, or they may not want to, but they don't. They're not really aware of a better way to handle the restructuring, and they'd rather be in control um, than than just let the company sort of sit in Chapter Eleven. And so the the benefits of the sale in Chapter Eleven. Is that we have something called a 363 sale order and that order will um, transfer the assets free and clear of all liens and claims and so things like successor liability that you'd be worried about outside of court actually just get wiped away for the most part um, the other advantage to a 363 sale is the court will include in the sale order that the sale was for fair market value so you do not have to worry uh, at a later date that um, a creditor could come forward and argue that it was a fraudulent transfer or, or, or an undervalued try to unwind the transaction. Um, so we, we do see sometimes actually purchasers who have been doing their diligence and are interested in the company and actually require that it be done through a chapter 11 so they can quote, cleanse the assets and make sure they're getting a clean company without future liability. Um, but it also is certainly an exit strategy for for some lenders, including uh, dip lenders, as 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 I just mentioned. Um, so I, I I know you have free and clear sales here, at least to some extent. Are you seeing that as an exit option for for some companies? Uh, yes, definitely. But uh, let me take a step back. One of the major changes which happened in twenty twenty, beginning of twenty twenty one, the law was on December twenty fourth, Christmas. Mm -hmm. But it only came into effect in 2021. There was a shift which has not been quite understood by everybody who's involved in these matters. It's called a creditor's plan, something you have in the US. Mm -hmm. So if a debtor's plan is not approved, the creditors may present and approve their own plan. The the big case is Samarco now, where, where the creditors have it, the bondholders have presented a plan, you know, and it's a huge judicial fight now. Uh, 
but but the shift has already occurred, which means the creditors are understanding that they have to decide how to solve that insolvency. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it wasn't like that before. Right. Only a debtor could present a restructuring plan. Now, with this shift, what you have now is that, A, distressed asset funds are blossoming because they're buying credits when the banks don't want to get involved in the messy business of restructuring. Mm -hmm. So they sell. But then these distressed asset funds, and now all the banks have created new departments to deal with restructurings and re renegotiation of debts. You have to look at the complete uh, tool kit you have in the restructuring. And the sale of assets now is, uh, is a very important tool. We, we had uh, one case which was very successful, which was in Erbras, you know, where where basically we we restructured the debt and sold the the debt, uh, and a, a creditor was ben had the benefit, but it assigned uh, its rights to to a final strategic buyer. So so this is coming, this is becoming much more frequent because now the creditors have the key to mitigate the losses which of course exist in every insolvency and and here the free and clear sale has a new aspect which uh, actually is not well drafted in the insolvency law but is interesting today you can sell a company with a restructured debt so if you have a buyer for a company but he wants a restructured debt and he wants a free and clear sale, it is possible to do so. We haven't done many of these sales, but it's becoming more and more frequent. And as you restructure, there are good examples of companies which can be actually, I understand in the US is one of the most common ways of restructuring a company. And this now can be achieved in Brazil. We, we're still short of case law and some precedents to make it as sound as we would like like to have it, but it works. And yeah. We have some good examples where, where this has, done, has been done. And the key here is the creditor plan. Uh, whether you, you have it or not, just the pressure for having this new remedy allows you at the negotiation table to structure for instance, a 363-like transaction in Brazil. Right, it changes the dynamics changes amongst completely. the parties. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because we have um, this concept, but it's it's rarely used because in, in Chapter 11, the debtor has the exclusive period to file the plan, and this period can be ex extended up to a year and a half. So it's very rare that the creditors can file their own plan. Now, if the creditors can show that there has been some sort of um, fraud or there's some reason they can't trust the debtors anymore to put forward their own plan, then we could have a creditor plan, but that is extremely rare. Exactly. So the debtor really is in control of the plan. And 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 I've I've only been here now for a day and a half, but I do keep hearing from 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 people that they consider us maybe creditor friendly in the US. And I thought, well, I hear about a creditor plan. That's that's very creditor friendly. But I think when we think about it, we think about even though the debtor has the control, really who's controlling the debtor? And in some ways, it's the dip lenders or the senior secured lenders. So when I hear this, that the U.S. is very creditor friendly, I think that is maybe the the concept rather than the the true ability to file a plan. Yeah, they say there's a difference between theory and practice. They yep. say in practice, the theory is somewhat different, right? That's right, right. If you looked at the uh, uh, on paper and you saw the law and you asked the bankruptcy judges, I think they would like to say they're not uh, pro debt or a pro creditor, they're pro reorganization, which is, is, is I think, um, the case 
in chapter 11, uh, I think the judges want to see the best outcome for the company, and that is usually having the company continue as a living, breathing thing um, and a healthier version of when it first came into court. And, and I think that is what most judges are, are guided by. I do think we have the the benefit of, of precedent. We've been doing this for you know, 50 some odd years at this point, and we have case law on any number of these points. And so it can give a lot of um, finality and predictability to the process, which can get investors, uh, lenders, purchasers quite comfortable with the Chapter 11 process because they, for the most part, barring some surprises that can always happen, know what is going to happen and know how they're going to be treated in a bankruptcy, whether, whether they like it or not. Um, and 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 it sounds like this case law is just getting started here. Yeah, yeah, it's it's beginning, but it it has changed many things already. Yeah, it seems just from the short time period that there's um, dynamic shifts and and um, maybe openings in the market for for different alternative investors to come in. So um, we did want to open it for questions. Uh, we've obviously been been talking for a while, and I know there's a lot going on here. So um, if anyone in the in the room or um, online uh, has any questions, please do do let us know. Oh, sure. Just to say quickly, we've received some questions online. I think one of the questions was just to understand the rejection of contracts more, and what is really the consequence of it. You know, for, for the for the other party, are they? How are they going to be ranking? You know, on the insolvency, we understand that in the U.S. they are, you know, considered an administrative debt. How is that in Brazil? Well, but just to correct the question, so it's it's considered a general unsecured claim, a rejection damages. So an administrative debt would actually be debt that you have to pay um, in cash uh, during the bankruptcy, but a general unsecured claim is treated as a essentially a pre-petition claim that um, can really have a, a severely impaired recovery because it is lowest on the priority level. So that would be a rejection damages claim in Chapter 11. Well, in our case, you know, as we don't have a, a, a provision which deals with rejection of contracts, uh, as I said, you, you basically you terminate the agreements you don't want before before you file, which gives rise to damages, and these damages are unsecured claims, right? Another way of dealing with certain contracts which are damaging for the company is if the plan uh provides for amendments to these contracts you know and the plan is then approved by a majority of creditors and uh, so so this this is something which still goes has to be approved by the court but this might be also treatment but we we don't have a clear uh, proceeding for rejection of contracts which you know from from what i saw in the latam case you have a company which have has let's say 450 air, air, aircraft, and all of a sudden there is COVID and something, and they only need 250 airlines to to cover whatever market there remains. In the U.S., you do that, mm -hmm. and then you kind of you do a debt to equity swap, and they all become shareholders of the new LATAM with 250 aircraft. It's not what happened in reality, you know, because then the market improved and so on. But uh, it, it puts the, the in case of airlines, the lessors in a tough spot because they're competing among themselves to be the ones which will stay in the company. And the company will always choose those which are more fuel efficient and more modern. So there is a lot of pressure on the lessors in this case, you know, and, uh, and uh, the, the lessee, the airline, has an, an advantage when negotiating with the lessors because they can pick and choose whatever airlines, the air, aircraft they, they want to stay. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Do I read it correctly? Yes, yes. And it, and it can affect the whole market. I mean, if you take aircraft, for example, um, uh, terminating all of those leases can then really affect the aircraft lessor market. Similarly, for retail, rejecting 
uh, leases for retail space leaves uh, commercial real estate developers and landlords um, potentially empty handed and you actually then see an entire new industry that is distressed. So it can have a real ripple effect um, in the industry when these uh, bankruptcies happen and, and, and these contracts and leases get rejected. We have another question for Thomas. The question is, if a Brazilian company decides to file for Chapter 11, how long does it take to have that recognized in Brazil, and is it a costly process? And will it get recognized in Brazil? Well, you know, if, if you apply the, the model law, the ancestral model law, it will be recognized, provided, provided. So there, there are certain certain aspects in the recognition proceeding which may create some difficulties uh, so what can i say we don't have many precedents you know the precedents we have are those i mentioned to you we have prosafe which worked beautifully and we have a few precedents where the company which was restructured abroad was not that relevant i mean they didn't give rise to any 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 litigation but uh, if you look at the structure of the law you know it's it's interesting and this is a question i want to to have you to comment on uh, basically what the law says is that you recognize foreign proceedings but some proceeding one proceeding will be the main proceeding the main proceeding is where Comey is. Comey is the center of main interest. That proceeding will govern. But you can have a lot of ancillary pro pro proceedings which will then be dealt with provided they don't violate basically the main proceeding or if they just simply complement or if there is a dialogue uh, between the two judges you know, to solve certain issues. So the ancillary proceeding could be useful. I believe so. But I would need, but my my question to you, Michel, is the following: What happens if there is only one proceeding? There is no ancillary proceedings, and this one proceeding takes place in a jurisdiction which is not the center of main interest. How do you deal with that? Well, we we have the concept of a foreign non-main proceeding which is a proceeding where the country has started its insolvency, not where it has its center of main interest, but where it has an establishment, so a place of operations. And for a lot of multinational companies, they can have an establishment in a lot of countries. So they can still use, uh, our chapter 15 has that concept. I don't know if you also have a foreign non-main option, but we do have these, um, uh, this type of ancillary proceeding. So they can still get the protection they need an, under Chapter 15. It's not automatic the way it would be for a foreign main proceeding, but it uh, is in the court's discretion. And I, I think when you look at the case law, it's rarely um, uh, rejected. It is usually approved, and you, you, a foreign non-main proceeding will get the same relief that a foreign main proceeding will. But uh, let me ask you, we're talking a situation where you have two proceedings, right? A main and a main, and then you, you have some, some differences. But what if there is only one proceeding which has been filed in a country which is not the center main of mm -hmm. main interest? How, how will this be dealt with? Yeah, they will, they will still get Chapter 15 relief as a foreign non-main proceeding. No, no, in a Chapter 11. Oh, in a Chapter 11, that they would file for Chapter 11, you're asking? They would they would file for Chapter Eleven. Yeah. The company, the, the the U.S. is not the country which really has jurisdiction over insolvencies mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. it's not the center of main proceed a main uh, main interest. Well, the the U.S. court orders are only as good as it has jurisdiction, right? So if a U.S. court order, um, even if it purports to be worldwide, it's only going to be as good as uh, as it is against uh, an entity it has jurisdiction over. So local creditors, employees uh, are probably not going to listen to a U.S. court order, and you're going to have to start a proceeding in that country. So you may have many proceedings uh, all around the world. I did want to ask Thomas, though, on dip financing for a, 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 an entity that, a, a Brazilian entity that may file for Chapter 11, 
but their assets are in Brazil, will a lender be able to get liens on those assets or will it have uh, an issue locally? Well, you know, in Brazil, we have many, many foreign loans, which uh, of course, Clifford Chance drafts most of these loans which are made into Brazil, you know, so so these foreign loans. How how do we look at foreign loans generally? Not not in an insolvency uh, uh, context, right? Uh, basically, what what we advise is to tropicalize the agreement to make sure that all the provisions, which are essential in Brazil to enforce the agreement, are there and that you can enforce this agreement in Brazil, although it's governed by U.S. law or English law or what have you, right? Well, the same holds true in in a in a dip loan, right? If you get a dip loan, you, true, you will have a lot that you will have the protections in the U.S., which if every dip loan has, and it may be important. But if you want to enforce it in Brazil, there's still a, another step you have to take, which I call it to tropicalize the agreement. It has to be enforceable in Brazil. So if you have a guarantee or a security, even if it's lovely and well-drafted under a foreign law or a, a New York law or a document or what have you, you still need a guarantee which is recognized in Brazil as a guarantee, so it will be considered a secured credit. Yeah, it's a very legal term, tropicalized. Yeah. <laughs> and I think one last question to wrap it up for both of you. What are kind of any legislative proposals going forward? What can we expect? Well, in Brazil, we had this major overhaul of the of the insolvency legislation. So I don't expect, although I would wish that uh, we we don't have anything very. Uh, we probably won't have uh, great uh, legal t changes in the in the insolvency legislation. You know, I keep trying to go back to Portuguese, but sometimes I I don't succeed. You know. So, so basically, what we have now is what we call jurisprudence or case law. So now it's very important that we have a number of cases which deal with these new aspects of the legislation, which are very helpful. You know, nowadays you can solve, take a case like Americanas, where you only have one class of creditors. If you can get to an agreement with 51% of the creditors, you could wrap this up in two months very quickly, which before wasn't possible. So what we need now is case law, using all these new tools which have now been introduced in our legislation and which we discussed here, and that will give more certainty to all the parties involved. So we're still in a phase where we have the, the new wording of the law. Sometimes it's not very well drafted from our perspective, you know, as restructuring lawyers. But, uh, but uh, this can be now solved by important case law, which, which is coming out in different cases and which will strengthen the possibility of using the, the, the good things which have been enacted. Yeah, well, I, I think maybe we should get the pre-insolvency stay, but I don't think anyone is, is thinking of that right now. Um, there's There are a couple of things. I mean, I, I don't think our Congress is, is about to do anything, um, uh, maybe anything, full stop, but anything to the bankruptcy code. Uh, but there, there are a couple of things that come up um, very often as controversial. Um, one is is the crypto collapse really and whether these crypto entities should be eligible for chapter 11 um, banks are not eligible stock brokers are not eligible and um, the regulators really had not caught up to crypto in general and what these crypto entities should really be classified as so obviously a number of them have filed for chapter 11 but there is this constant scrutiny about whether that should be more defined and whether they should be able to utilize uh, chapter 11. another big issue for us and i wonder if um, you have this issue but a little differently is is forum shopping and that is um, companies deciding which bankruptcy courts they 
they want to file their cases in, even though the bankruptcy code is a federal law and it's meant to be applied evenly and the same throughout the country. There are, of course, um, states that have uh, judges with different views or who just don't have the sophistication. So most cases get filed in New York, Delaware and Texas right now. But of course, if you went to North Dakota, a judge may never have seen a billion dollar dip and it's going to be difficult for them to understand all of the different provisions and protections that we include in these types of documents. And so um, that is where the cases are con concentrated. There are people who argue that the cases should really be filed where your headquarters are located, where your employees are, and things like where you are more locally present. But uh, in reality, the law says you can file where you're formed. And for many companies, that's Delaware. Uh, it also says where you have um, your asset, where you have substantially all of your assets. And so some companies will form a shell subsidiary and have all of that shell subsidiaries assets located in a bank account in New York. And so there are these sort of forum um, tricks that can go around so that companies can be before certain sophisticated courts. Uh, obviously, I've been seeing this fight uh, break out Rio versus Sao Paulo for Americanas. I imagine this is something that um, uh, people may litigate over here. Okay, so the law here says that uh, the court which has jurisdiction is a court of the principal establishment of the debtor. Now, you take a company which has a factory in Bahia, factory in the south, two factories in Sao Paulo, and so on. Where, where do you file? So you have some flexibility, mm -hmm. you know. Experience have shown that when companies decide to file in a very small town in the interior of Mato Grosso, the creditors get very upset because it will take two days for them to reach the mm -hmm. town and then wait for the judge to appear there, which sometimes takes another week, a few weeks, you know. <laughs> so, so, and, and there you, and because it's state jurisdiction, it's not federal jurisdiction, you will find a great discrepancy among the different states and also about the legislation in different states. And there are some crucial issues which sometimes uh, determine which is the most favorable for, for that company. Let's, let's put it in an elegant way. Which, which form would be the most efficient to restructure the company? And, uh, and of course, you know, some people think it's better to file in a small town which has 20,000 inhabitants and where the judge has never seen a, a restructuring before, you know, or an insolvency before, let alone of a large company. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes this large company is the employer of all the people who live in that town and right. so on. So it's a choice which you have. Mm -hmm. But uh, experience has shown that being too smart is not always the best remedy in this. Right. In the, in yeah. This matter. Yes. Yeah. We've seen that too. Okay. I think that's time. We'll we'll be around. Uh, hopefully, enjoying drinks with all of you. And and um, thank you for everyone who joined uh, virtually. And thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much.